in Patrick Morrissey. Patrick, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Uh, just available for general con- consultation right now. <laughs> he, he adjudicated tennis calls. He can certainly help you with your basketball calls, Mr. Bodwell. I appreciate that, sir. They're calling the, the body check a little bit too quickly, too closely on that one. Uh, Patrick, let's get into it, man. Your office has been busy once again. You know, it's been a hectic stretch, but uh, things went well during legislative session. Uh, we have some great things to report. I think we're on our way to uh, getting our opioid foundation up and running. I think that's going to be very positive, and uh, we're working very, very hard on a case right now that we're hopeful the Supreme Court will take up and side with us, and uh, we're just keeping busy. So it's a it's a great stretch, and I'm glad to be on with you today. Are you, in regards to the Supreme Court, are you talking about the uh, sports um, bill with the uh, women in sports? Yes. So okay. can, can you, you get into that? Know, yeah, a couple of years ago, the legislature passed a law and it, it distinguished between uh, men and women and indicated that biological males uh, should not be playing in women's sports. And right after that law was passed, it was quickly challenged. And in fact, a uh, federal district court judge placed an injunction on the law. And so we went to work and we submitted, I believe, over 500 entries to the court, over 3,000 pages of evidence. And after that process was completed, the district court judge position changed. He eliminated the injunction and then issued a summary judgment for our office. And that's on the merits. And so we thought that we were able to really show the differences between uh, men and women, and that it was rational for the legislature uh, to take the steps that it did. And so we we got that back in January, but then the uh, plaintiffs quickly appealed to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, and then without any rationale or written reasoning, the Fourth Circuit reinstated the injunction, and so the law was temporarily put back on hold, Now, uh, we went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. We filed last week, and we're asking the court to lift the injunction uh, because we think that the state is very likely to prevail on the merits, the substance. And this us, it's a matter of common sense and fairness that uh, biological males uh, not be allowed to participate in female sports. It's been such a positive trend for women to participate in sports and uh, the development of Title IX. I think a lot of women look back at their participation in sports as being an incredible positive in their life and their uh, ability to develop leadership skills. And so we're very hopeful that we're going to prevail on the merits and we're going to uh, probably hear in upcoming weeks about the status here. But it's the first time this specific issue is going to be up before the high court and, uh, you know, we've got a pretty good batting average overall. Uh, I can't predict when and where we'll win, but I, I'd li- ra- much rather be on our side than the other side. This, as it pertains just to high school and, and, and younger sports, correct, it does not apply collegiately? No, it would pl- apply collegiately as well. It, I mean, it goes across the board, and I think that was correct. It, you know, Rob, if you remember uh, last year, There was a lot of angst when you saw Leah Thomas and the NCAA Women's uh, Swimming Championships. And I think a lot of people in West Virginia across the country, uh, they became pretty animated because they they just thought it was unfair uh, for the women's championship to uh, have biological males competing. So uh, this applies across the board. And uh, we're hopeful that the court agrees with us. How would that work if the NCAA permits that? How would that work if West Virginia does not in regards to, let's say, a Big 12 swim meet that takes place at West Virginia? Well, I don't think we've encountered these specific issues uh, at this point, but I, I know that we're it, the law would obviously step up and prevent these uh, activities from occurring because it's meant to ensure that biological males don't play sports with 
females. And so that would be the law of the state of West Virginia. And as I said, I, I haven't seen this encountered yet in terms of NCAA here in West Virginia, but uh, the law would apply, and I think it should apply, because this is basic fairness. I, to be honest, I, it's a really hard argument, I think, for someone to suggest that uh, given all the advantages that biological males have, that they should be participating. And I think West Virginia has been out in front with this common sense rule. That, that may be a logical argument, but if the NCAA has a rule that says, other than what West Virginia says, does this effectively put West Virginia in a situation where they, NCAA or the Big 12 says you can't have home swim meets or Look, you can't I, have home track meets or gonna, something? I don't think it's going to come to that because, quite frankly, I think that as time develops, uh, you're seeing more and more states step up and say that uh, these rules are common sense and that there should be a distinction uh, between uh, men and women. And I think the, the, as states keep adding uh, their new laws to the list, West Virginia is not the only state with this law. There are quite a few that have put this on the books. So right. This is obviously getting tested now, but I think this is going to continue to grow. And, uh, look, there are a lot of controversial issues out there, plenty for people to debate and discuss. Uh, But I think when it comes to this topic, this is something that the vast majority of Americans and West Virginians agree on. So I think you're going to keep seeing uh, evolution in the laws across the country on this topic. And I think that's positive. Right now, does this break down as a red state, blue state thing, Patrick, like so many things do? You know, I don't know if it's red state, blue state. I think that uh, we've seen that... uh, This is the issue that cuts across any partisan divide, that uh, Democrats, independents, Republicans, I think, are mostly in unison on this issue. I know that uh, probably a lot of the states that have uh, passed this legislation may be red states, but in terms of uh, people's support on this issue, it, it cuts across the partisan divide, which is not typical on many issues. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you in terms of how people feel about that, but I, I know you're an attorney, and I know the other side has attorneys too. So as I, I think about what the next logical step is, if the Supreme Court says, yes, in West Virginia you can have this law, but as it applies to colleges as opposed to high schools, uh, that becomes a bit more complex, and I can see even more attorneys and more Supreme Court cases getting involved in this, especially if the, let's say, that's, I'm going to pick on the Big 12 Conference because that's where West Virginia is right now, until somebody else leaves and then there's another conference realignment. But if the Big 12 conference says, okay, well, you know, you can't host track meets. You can't host swim meets in West Virginia because you're you're not inclusive with, because of this law, not every athlete can participate where they want to participate. So therefore, you can't have a home game when it comes to that. You've got to travel to this state's area. I'll be honest, I don't think that it's going to get to that point. My, My real hope here is that people start to apply common sense. And I recognize, Rob, you're, you're right. There are going to be people, there are going to be lawyers willing to challenge everything. One thing I've learned as Attorney General is that after every legislative session, regardless of the merits of the suit, we get uh, hit with one lawsuit after another mm-hmm. because they couldn't succeed in convincing members of the House of Delegates or State Senate of their position, and they're going to resort to the courts. And You know, our record has been strong, but I I do think that as this issue has been developing, that there's going to become a greater consensus. Now, it may take a little bit of time um, because I think that this issue kind of came up uh, pretty rapidly just over the last three or four years where more and more people are talking about it. But I do think that uh, across the country, people do view this as basic fairness. Now, uh, will it take five or ten years for most of the states across the country uh, to have similar laws. I can't put a timeline on it, but I do think that uh, over time that will certainly be the case. Matt? Patrick, are there any other states that are joining you right now in this issue before the Supreme Court, or at at least right now behind you in some way? Uh, Yes, we're expecting that there will be a number of states that file a supportive brief uh, we don't have the exact list right now, but we do know that 
a lot of states are have contacted our office and they've reached out indicating that they want to be supportive of, of us. The other thing that we're likely to see is that there will be dozens and dozens of female athletes who will likely be submitting supportive briefs as well. And I think that's a powerful uh, message to the court. Does there seem to be much on the reverse side of things? Like, clearly, we, we talk a lot about uh, um, a, a natural-born male who says or, or goes through whatever these processes are. They're transgender, and now they want to participate in female sports. Do we see the opposite very much, where there's a, a young lady who says, no, now I'm, I'm a guy, and I want to participate in men's sports? You know, we haven't encountered that as much. We know that, there, I mean, there are fact patterns across the board on these issues. I think one of the things that uh, we've been doing is looking at the number of instances where people get displaced. So if there's a, uh, a biological male competing in women's sports, obviously when that happens and the biological male scores higher or uh, takes a medal, that's obviously uh, pushing the ability of women to win uh, down lower and lower. Uh, obviously, you don't hear as much about the other fact patterns, but I know that there are a lot of different fact patterns out there. Uh, obviously, we're focusing on this particular fact pattern because we're trying to lift the injunction, and that's for a bi biological male trying to participate in the female sports. Does Title IX play into this in some way, shape, or form? As it it does, yeah. actually. And, in fact, uh, one of the big aspects of the district court decision is that the judge thought that the law uh, was not only constitutional but consistent with Title IX because the plaintiffs um, have been arguing that it's not. Uh, but I think many people who knew Title IX and grew up with Title IX knew that it was about expanding opportunities for women including athletic opportunities. And I think that uh, as the court focuses on that issue, they're going to see that this is consistent with Title IX. It's consistent with the state's ability to regulate and provide for uh, the type of athletic opportunities for women. And so I think that on the merits, I, I, I mean, we pick a lot of cases up. This is one of the strongest cases that we've had and that we're asking the high court to to weigh in on. And, uh, you know, as I said, I can't predict the date and the time that we're going to win because there are always procedural issues that you're grappling with. Um, but I, I feel pretty good about it. Patrick, Jonathan Bodwell, I just want to say thank you for, for pushing this issue as someone who had a daughter who played a lot of sports and loved it. It would have crushed her to have to deal with, with this. Thankfully, we didn't have to. I think it's just endemic of a lot of the problems in America when it takes 3,000 pages to explain that men have a serious issue, uh, have, a, have a serious, uh, they're, they're, they're better. I mean, they're stronger, they're faster, not necessarily better skill-wise, but that it's unfair to women to have to play against men that it takes 3,000 pages to do that. And I hope we're, we're getting the word out like crazy. I'm going to, when I get when I get off the air, I'm going to text my daughter who's up at WVU now, and I'm going to tell her she needs to write a letter of support of this as a female athlete. Um, and I, I think well, tens of thousands uh, need to. Look, uh, thank you for saying that. What's really interesting is that uh, one of the uh, individuals who's filing the appeal along with us, a uh, really courageous young woman, Lainey Armstead, uh, she participated in soccer at West Virginia State, and she tells the story very articulately about what it was like for her growing up, and she uh, participated, and she said she had brothers, and she talks uh, personally about what she thinks are the differences, and it's not just the personal stories, though. I mean, we have all the scientific evidence, and we, we kind of puncture the myths that people say about the competitive advantage and there are a lot of detailed studies that we put forth and i think which which prove our case and that's what our hope is that this is decided based upon the law it's decided based upon the science it's not decided based on other factors and as i said there are a lot of issues for us to disagree with but uh, this should certainly not be one of them. Patrick, let's switch gears. We're talking with Attorney General Patrick Morrissey here. 
And uh, I know we even talked to Treasurer Riley more about this not too long ago, and this has to do with the MasterCard Visa plan for a new category on gun shop sales. And this is not going to happen now because of some pressure that's been put on them. Yeah, so this is interesting. Uh, Way back in September, I'm not sure if we talked about it when I was on your show, but we sent letters. I think I was one of the first states in the country, uh, and I sent a letter to Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and we urged them to reconsider the decision to apply new merchant codes, uh, which would single out firearm purchases from other uh, general sales. And uh, we started that process. And five days later, later, we joined a coalition of 24 states, in that case led by Montana and Tennessee, and we demanded that the companies abandon these new merchant code plans. And we were very worried about targeting and collection of data, singling gun, owner, gun owners out. And so we've been on this for a long while. I know that then the legislature has uh, moved uh, a bill through, which is designed to uh, further protect against this. So last week, we know that uh, MasterCard and Visa announced that they were moving in a different direction. And we think that that's good uh, because we don't want uh, gun owners to be singled out uh, because you worry about where that data is going to go, how that's collected. Uh, gentlemen, we are right now are in the middle of a big lawsuit against the ATF uh, over something called the pistol brace rule. And one of the parts of that rule that really animates a lot of West Virginians and Americans is that uh, people are going to have to register if they rely on these pistol braces because they're, uh, the, the gun is going to be kind of transformed into a short barrel rifle under the law. And so people get very worried when their data is getting collected and they don't have control over it. And I think that's why this obtained the kind of public support that it did and why you saw the West Virginia legislature step up and, quite frankly, why you saw some of these companies reconsider their decision. And before we run out of time, and I'll let uh, Matt and Jonathan fill in with some questions after that, but I want to make sure we get this out there, too. The Groff versus DeJoy case and uh, religious freedom. Yeah, this is a pretty cool thing uh, because we are involved in another case up at the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, there is an individual who is a mail carrier, and he was asked to work on Sundays, And uh, Groff resigned because they wouldn't give him a blanket exemption from the Sunday shift. And he then sued, and he argued that the Postal Service was discriminating against him for refusing to accommodate his religious beliefs. And we think that he's correct. Uh, The federal appeals court last year ruled against Groff, and he said that that granting that exemption would burden other workers. But we believe that uh, employees have the ability to exercise their religious rights. And we know that observing the Sabbath is critical for many as they're practicing their faith. So we wrote a brief in support of that because I know there are a lot of people in West Virginia who care about uh, these religious exceptions. And we know uh, that there were a lot of discussions about that uh, in the context of COVID. Uh, this comes up all the time. So we thought we could weigh in in strong support of the First Amendment and people's deeply held religious convictions. And we will be uh, watching for the U.S. Supreme Court to rule. All right, Matt Miller. Uh, or, or Jonathan, Jonathan Bob. Well, I think you have a question related to this. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I was, I mean, there are so many different things that the Attorney General's office weighs in on. Is there anything major coming down the pike that you guys sort of have in the hopper that you know you're going to have to weigh in on that you haven't yet? Well, I will say this. We have a another trial coming up against Kroger uh, for the opioid uh, issues, the litigation we've been involved in. And I know there'll be some very big news coming soon in terms of the distribution and the opioid foundation and all the resources, how that's managed and allocated for the states. Uh, but you know, we talked about some of the recent ones, but we're always trying to identify different ways where we can protect West Virginians and we can step up. And, of course, 
we're going to enforce our law. One thing I will tell you, we'll probably talk about on the next show, we are right now going through all of the legislation uh, that was just passed during this past session, and we're going to be identifying uh, areas that we think that uh, could be subject to litigation so we can get ready and start to prepare our defense and or talk to our clients about it. So that's a process that we'll probably no answers to in the next couple weeks, but they passed hundreds of bills. So now it's up to our office to kind of go through and say, okay, we think this one's going to get challenged, that one's going to get challenged, and then that way we can be ready. The Berkeley County Commission, is that going to get challenged? Or can we call them the commission again as opposed to having to call them counsel? Have you looked at that one yet? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I have not looked at that one no. yet, no. But, that's, that's, uh, hey, you know, there's, people are there's another there. eternal number of issues we can certainly yes. look at. And Look, I've been proud to keep pretty busy. We've been able to get a lot done, and it's been a, it's been a very busy but fun stretch. Yeah. We've obviously been fortunate to have a lot of success. And I will tell you that uh, we will probably have some Eastern Panhandle news on some topics in upcoming weeks. I will tease that out for you. I did have a serious question, though. You've mentioned a couple of times the Opioid Foundation and, and getting that going. Explain that more to our, our listeners. A absolutely. So I think many people know that we've been uh, fighting back against the opioid epidemic now for many years, and we had brought litigation against many entities within the pharmaceutical supply channel. And fortunately, we've been successful in our litigation. And in fact, West Virginia has uh, the highest per capita settlements in the nation. And I think people know that we've been successful in how we've uh, attacked this problem and attacked the litigation. Well, once you are successful bringing in the settlements, you have to decide how the money is going to get allocated. And so what we did is we got together with every single county in the state of West Virginia and virtually every municipality and reached an agreement as to how the settlement money would be managed and allocated. And what we came up with was something called the West Virginia First Memorandum of Understanding. And what it did is it uh, decided how the monies would be split across the state and then who would manage those dollars. And 24.5% of the money is going to go directly back to the counties and to the cities. But 72.5% of the dollars are going to go to a foundation. And that foundation is going to be managed by 11 board members, six appointed through the regions across West Virginia, five appointed by the governor, subject to confirmation by the Senate. The foundation that I referenced a few minutes ago, uh, the legislature just moved a bill through recognizing and supporting this West Virginia First Foundation and then setting up a structure that would allow the governor to make his appointees. So that's what I was referencing. And we're excited because this was kind of necessary to get to the next level so that ultimately resources can start to get distributed out across the state and into the hard hit communities so more healing can begin. Patrick, I know we're out of time. I thank you very much for yours. Any final thoughts from you? No, uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in the Upcoming weeks, we'll be back up in the panhandle and hope everyone's doing well. All right. Uh, when are you going to announce you're running for governor or senator? Ah, well, stay tuned. I may have some news for you in the next few weeks. All right. I'll be here. You know where to find me. All right. We'll get you out to uh, whatever announcement we do have, maybe for conservation district supervisor. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. All right, see you guys.